This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavour, electrolyte drink mix into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasener formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavours such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more. Just head over to LMNT to find out. Or better still, go down to the show notes, click on the link, the sleep for performance link, to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well. You don't even need to send it back. So check it out at LMNT in the show notes. Welcome back to Sleep for Performance Christmas special. This is a Christmas special because I'm today I am joined by Melanie. Melanie, I have people have told me about your poster at European Sleep that you recently presented. Uh, one of my scientific advisors, Tim Smitties, who was there from Ireland. And he sent me a picture of your poster and he said, Ian, you got to talk to this lady. She's been doing this cool project on reindeers and reindeer sleep. So I thought this would be perfect just before Christmas to talk to you, Melanie, about how reindeer sleep, because I think there's going to be lots of kids listening to this, wondering if the reindeers are well rested for Santa Claus to bring them around the world and give out lots of presents. So I'm hoping you can tell us today that the reindeer is well rested and ready for Christmas Eve. <laughs> That's such a cute introduction. <laughs> <It's> very well. <laughs> Melanie, welcome. Uh, whereabouts are you best, Melanie? Thank you. Sorry? Whereabouts are you today? Where are you living? Uh, I'm uh, close to Zurich in Switzerland. Oh, so it's good. morning here. Yeah, I just got up an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> very good. I, I've been to Zurich maybe 20 years ago, tw- maybe maybe uh, 20 years ago, 21 years ago was the last time I was in Zurich. Very nice city, but very expensive. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. And are you from Switzerland originally? Yeah, I'm from Lucerne. Oh, okay. Like the touristic city of Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> ah, very good. I should introduce you because I'm Irish originally, but I live in Western Australia. But one of my PhD students here is actually from Switzerland. Ah, oh, really? Yeah, he's oh, looking nice. at sleep and shift work and athletes. So I should introduce you. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Melanie, recently um, you are based with the, if I get this right, you are at the, are you at the Child Development Center and Children's Research Center in Zurich? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's um, at the Children's Hospital. Yeah. So um, I first started off doing research or sleep research in children and there I learned all my skills and then I went on to reindeer. But the mm. reindeer project is a collaboration also with the University of Zurich, with a group there, and of course with people in Norway. So the yeah, yeah. Arctic University of Norway. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. So um so you did your training in like children, pediatric sleep. Were you looking at sleep problems and disorders like um, classic sleep disorders or were you just looking at behavioral stuff? I did not look at uh, classic sleep disorders, but I um, also investigated children with ADHD and checked if they sleep 
maybe a bit different than children without oh. ADHD. That was my I, first project. <laughs> really? Okay, that's very, very interesting. We, we might have to talk about that another day, but just very quickly, do children with ADHD sleep worse than kids without? Yes, so generally they do have more sleep problems, yes. But what we were looking at was a bit more detailed what the brain is actually doing, how deep they are sleeping. So maybe mm. they don't even feel what we found, but also there um, we found some differences in their deep sleep. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. We sh- we may have a chat about that another day because I'm very interested yeah. in that area. So that's, that's very good. I think I might have ADHD. I like lots of things and can't concentrate. So maybe it's my superpower, though, I say. So, yeah, yeah, it can also be a superpower. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. It's my, it's, I, I always say that's my superpower, being have, a, have an ADHD as an adult. It's good because yeah. I like lots of different things. Yeah, if you can handle it right, then. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can handle it, but anyway. <laughs> So, Melanie, you decided to look at uh, reindeers, um, but this is quite interesting because reindeers obviously just live in the Arctic um, in, or, or, or in the Northern Hemisphere. Can you tell us a little bit about the reindeer and the sort of animal that it is and kind of what it does? Just give us a generic overview of what a reindeer is. Yeah. So I'm not the reindeer expert, but I can tell you as much okay. as I know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they live. Uh, where it's really cold so they of course have a very very thick dense fur to keep warm and um, but they really like it cold so they're really adapted to this environment and I think what is also for us really interesting about reindeer is that um, the conditions across the year change a lot so Mm. in summer they they have a lot of food available it's always light so they are really active they eat a lot and so on. And then in autumn, they mate and then in and still eat. <laughs> but then at one point, it will be all frozen in winter and covered by snow. And there they, they are then less active and also eat much less because there's just less available. So it's less worth it to go around yeah. a lot and it's dark. And then in spring, they, yeah, they have their cubs. <laughs> they, have their, they have their cubs. Is that what you call them? Cubs. Yeah. Calves. What did you, uh, oh, yeah, calves, calves, sorry. Calves, oh, sorry. Calves, sorry, calves. <laughs> sorry. I thought offspring. you said cubs. I, I thought, maybe I was oh, thinking no. bears, yeah. Okay, so they have the calves then in, in spring. So how many calves would they have? A, is it just one at a time or do they have two, yeah. three, four? Just one? No, usually just one, yeah. Just one, yeah. And it's um, super rare that they have twins, yeah. Okay, so, oh, okay, very interesting. And so in the winter, um, so do you, well, let me ask you this. In general, do you know how reindeers sleep before you did this work? So do, do, was there any sort of work on reindeers before around sleep? And yeah, what, what sort of was the basis of this before you looked at it? Mm-hmm. So no, um, actually, we did not know at all how they mm-hmm. really sleep. We only knew how active they are. So there were studies around about uh, using uh, like these activity trackers, but yeah. maybe you also have one, I could imagine. Yeah, yeah. I've got some in the drawer. Yeah. One. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they place these on the, I think on the collar or somewhere on the reindeer. And yeah. like this, they could just see how active they are and if how the activity rhythm is. But just because they're inactive doesn't mean, uh, mean that they are asleep. So to mm. really know if they're sleeping, we then decided to try to do EEG on reindeer. Okay, really interesting. Now, did I read correctly, or am I right in saying, is there something that happens with the reindeer's eye in terms of the lens across the year? Does something change with the reindeer of, of their eye? Um, I, I've also heard that, but to be honest, I don't know more about this. I cannot okay. tell you. I, <laughs> Sorry. I, thought I, I thought I read something about that before, but I can't remember. But that's okay. So um, obviously these reindeer, we didn't, we don't know how they sleep. You you were the first person to do this, to put EEG on reindeers. You're the very first group to do this, correct? Yeah. Well, as this far is, as we know, yes. As far as we know, <laughs> unless somebody's yeah. done it and published it 2,000 yeah. years ago, we don't know. So, <laughs> so absolutely nothing was known. How do you put EEG, which measures brain activity in humans? So like people might see on TV, you got these electric pads. How do you put that on a reindeer? How do you get the reindeer and stick that on their head? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> so, um, because many people told us maybe you, you have to implant these electrodes like you would do in mice or so, but we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to harm our reindeer. So what we wanted to do is to use a method that is very similar to what we do in humans. So we just place the electrodes on their skin. But in order to make them stay there, we had to use a lot of super glue. <laughs> mm. So we just used a lot of glue to make the electrodes stick. And of course, we had to shave a bit the uh, fur yeah, on these places. Um, but the reindeer, after they got used to it, they actually quite liked our spa treatment that we did on them. <laughs> So in the beginning, they didn't like it so much. Yeah, we yeah. had to hold their head a bit. But at the end, most of them just didn't care anymore and were really relaxed. And there was no problem. Yeah. And, and of so... course, we we had them in a stable, so oh, that okay. they were a bit restricted. To so that was my next question. Was it, Were these reindeer part of a farm or were they wild? Or were they just part of, in case of any kids are listening, were they just part of Santa's herd? <laughs> they're part of santa's university <laughs> heard that's good santa's university uh, yeah. yeah so we went, went to santa university and we got these yeah. reindeer very good <laughs> they, how, yeah. how many reindeer um did you put the eeg on um four yeah four. so in the main study we had four reindeer yeah four reindeer. But we, always the same four so we could compare them across the year and more than males or, or females um, they were all female. Yeah. All females. Because females are a bit easier to handle. They are yeah. not so aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And I presume you got ethics from Santa Claus to do this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Santa gave you the green light. It was all good to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, what time of year did you did you collect this EEG data? Was it in the winter or the summer? Or did you collect two periods to look at the um, difference? Uh, both actually yeah. so in winter summer and also in fall oh, because yeah. like this we had three different conditions so always dark always light or light and dark oh very good so, yeah <laughs> excellent and so um where about did this take place was it up in norway yeah it was in northern norway exactly in tromsø in, in tromsø yeah okay it's up yeah. the very top inside the arctic circle near where santa claus lives in case of any kids are listening uh -huh. don't, go, don't be careful if you go up there i think you want santa claus to see you um so when you got the eg recordings were they recorded locally on the render or were they getting transmitted back to the laboratory or to a local base or did, were they recorded locally on the on the eg uh, they were recorded locally. So we had a very little device that we placed on their back and yeah. it was stored in the device. And then right after we would transfer it to the computer and the hard drive and so on. <laughs> yeah. And in those periods in the summer and the winter and the spring, how many days or how many nights did the reindeer have the EG on for? Uh, around four days. Four days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you had four days in each condition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's ask some very simple questions is how many hours do a reindeer sleep in spring, summer and winter? What exactly are the hours? The, um, that's not such a simple question, actually, oh, it's simple. <laughs> because, <Yeah>. it <laughs> because it depends what you count as sleep. Mm. So th they have uh, the same sleep phases like we humans do half so non-REM sleep and REM sleep maybe you've yeah. heard of it and um, if we just count it it was maybe five six hours per and there was not a big difference across the year so oh. no matter what year it was which season they always slept um, about this much but then why I said it's not an easy question is because you could also count phases of rumination as sleep so when they chew the cut so while they chew the cut they seem to also be asleep really? and if you also count this then it's even more than like six hours yeah it's so rather eight so whilst they're eating they're in a state of like being relaxed which is called rumination which is kind of like being asleep yeah so so yeah when they like they are somehow able to 
died to fulfill this digestive function of rumination, but also the sleep recovery function mm. at the same time. That's what we found. So if we look at these phases when they are chewing, we can see in the brain waves that there are signs of non-REM sleep during this time. And from this, we thought, hmm, maybe they're actually asleep. Also, if you look at them, they, they are sitting, they often have their eyes closed, so they're really, really still. And then if you, yeah, if we really analyze this and look at, um, we look at slow wave activity. So we look at the deep sleep phases and how deep yeah. they sleep. And like this, we can see how, how sleep is regulated. And if we look at this, we see that actually rumination seems to contribute to sleep recovery, to, yeah, to dissipate sleep pressure, how we call it. Yeah. This, is fa- this is fascinating. So when they're, when they're say, let's say when they're asleep in these REM phases of sleep, it could be five to six hours, but then during the day when they're, when they're chewing away, eating away or sitting down during this rumination phase, which is similar to slow wave activity sleep, which is also contributing to the lowering of the sleep pressure for that animal. How many hours of rumination may they have a day? Two, three, four? Uh, around, it's quite, it depends how much they eat and what they eat, but around two to three hours, around yeah. three, I would say. Yeah. So if we add those, the rumination and the sleep, it's kind of similar to humans. They're getting somewhere around eight to nine hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're quite similar to us. I was also surprised yeah. in many ways. This is very interesting. And is this the same? Has there been any other studies done in any sort of like deer, horse, cows with similar findings? Yes. So um, concerning the rumination part, the I think the most or a recent study that was quite convincing, what which found something similar was a study in sheep mm. um, that I found. So there they also, they concluded that sometimes they are asleep and sometimes not while they are ruminating. But they also found that both can happen at the same time. Yeah. Right. And then there are quite some older studies in um, goats and I'm not sure cows, but I think also sheep again that already found this 40 years ago or so. Yeah, yeah. For sure, very long ago already. But not many people have looked at it in detail. I don't know why. (laughs) Yeah, it's very interesting. And it's interesting because you don't don't have a background in zoology. No. You did pediatrics. So why did you want to go and look at reindeers? How did this arise? This is very interesting. So, yeah, my background is, uh, so I studied biology in my bachelor and then neuroscience in my master and PhD. And yeah, I'm just interested at the, like I want to know how the brain and especially how the brain during sleep works and why we are sleeping and why our yeah. brain needs us to sleep. And for this, I think it's really interesting to not only look at humans or mice or rats, but to include everything we can get from nature to really understand it better. Yeah, yeah. And no, I, I agree. We've got a couple of episodes actually <laughs> coming out looking at sleeping birds um around sleep for performance podcast we've got some episodes coming mm-hmm. out so this this episode obviously comes out around christmas and just like uh, the week before we'll have a episode out looking at um woolly wagtail birds and then in february we have another episode coming out on birds as well and in 2023 mm-hmm. we're going to have some episodes on primates and you know monkeys and stuff and sleep as well so we're starting to explore a little bit more about sleep and animals so this is quite nice that this study I'm fits really in here. To hear. Yeah, it's yeah. good. And I, I like, I like to, like you, I want to learn more about, because most of my work has been in athletes or shift workers. And I want to move out now and look at sleep more broadly in different areas and explore it in philosophy, psychology, and in zoology as well. Mm-hmm. So in 2023, these are some of the things I'll be exploring and looking a bit more and looking to see, you know, what we have in common with other animals on the planet, as opposed to people trying to see why we're different. I want to look at why we're common. So when you look That's at right. rain, reindeer, do the reindeer have, you know, the same sort of circadian cycles as humans do over a 24-hour period? Do they have like a high and a low circadian dips? Um, how have, how is, uh, do they have a circadian cycle that comes from like the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN? Is it similar to humans or is it completely different? That's the big question that many people are interested in when they study uh, reindeer, actually. Yeah. So, and it's also the reason why we started to to go there and study reindeer, because what we know 
is that in summer and winter, when there is constant light, that then the reindeer lose their 24 hour um, rhythm. So mm. they, they just, they're generally um, just that it's clear. So they don't just sleep, I don't know, the six, nine hours in a row and then they are awake, but they rather sleep five minutes and they are 10 minutes awake, then they sleep three minutes and so on. So they're really polyphasic sleepers. But still, if you look at the sleep-wake rhythm or their activity, you can see that in summer and winter, the distribution of this is quite random. So we cannot see this rhythm. But in um, spring and fall, you can see that they sleep more during the night than during the day. Okay. And, and this is quite special because usually if I would put you in a dark or in a constant environment without any light or other time cues, you would still continue to have a more or less 24 hour rhythm, yeah. a circadian rhythm, but reindeer seem to not have that. And there have been more studies looking at this. And we also have another study where we looked a bit more at this part of the story. And yeah, it seems to be very complicated and we still don't really know what is going on. But some parts in this whole circadian system seem to be regulated differently. Okay. And, and so the, the, so you're saying they're more polyphasic sleep in the, in the summer? They're always and polyphasic. All of, yeah, but the periods are, there's smaller periods in the summer. Is that right? It's more how the periods are distributed across the 24 hours. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. In, so maybe in uh, September, you have more of them at night than, or more sleep periods or long, and longer yeah. ones at night and more the less and shorter ones during the day. But in summer and winter, it doesn't matter what time it is. Yeah. Always similar. Okay. And what, what, what we're talking about there for anybody listening is um, sleep periods get called like monophasic, biphasic, or polyphasic. Monophasic is just like one sleep period. You go to bed and sleep eight hours. Biphasic is you might sleep for six hours overnight and have a two-hour nap in the afternoon. And polyphasic is you will have multiple sleep episodes across a 24-hour period. And that's what Melanie's talking about there is a distribution of those. And it doesn't really matter once you make up your seven to nine hours across the day. However, for us in Western society as humans, we very much are kind of locked into a monophasic because we can't have multiple naps during the day at work. If we're driving a car or driving a train or flying an aircraft, we can't just kind of turn off for an hour or two each time. So our society has become more monophasic over time. Um, so with this research and this collaboration with the, with the team up in Norway, is this something that you're going to look to publish this study that you've done in this poster? Is this something you're going to publish in a peer reviewed journal or has it been published already? It hasn't been published yet, yeah. <laughs> but we're we're getting there. So we're now writing the manuscript. So we're writing the papers okay. now, and we hope that we. I think we won't make it for Christmas, unfortunately. <laughs> but at least the podcast will. That's really it will, nice. Yeah. Yeah. It'll, <laughs> but it'll sometime be a next year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see when next year, but for sure sometime next year we will. I mean, oh, that's absolutely. Sure. That's you absolutely. You never know, but. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. What an interesting piece of work. And it's really, it's, uh, I want to commend you on this work, because it's great to see people kind of stepping outside of their normal field. It's quite brave to jump out from children into reindeer. It's completely different. And it's quite brave to jump across and do that, Melanie. So it's actually, it's 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 really interesting. Um, and, and well done. Going forward, are you going to do more stuff in animals? Are you going to do more reindeer, other animals? What's your goal going forward? Me personally? Yeah, for this research, you want to um, do more stuff or go back I to actually, kids? I don't know yet. So right now I will a little bit not really go back to kids, but yeah, still work at the children's hospital. Yeah. And then we will see what what doors open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and but I so, think generally the reindeer project, maybe there will be more to come, but also there we have to. <laughs> you have to see yeah and whereabouts are you in your career at the moment Melanie have you finished your PhD postdoc after postdoc whereabouts are you I actually just um, had my defense three weeks ago so oh. I'm printing my thesis now and yeah almost yeah, kind of done <laughs> very good thank you congratulations well done so you're finished you finished your PhD <laughs> yeah. yeah and this <laughs> yeah. was this was all in, in kids as well in children's sleep behavior um, no, so it was actually very 
a bit difficult to write my thesis because the first part was about children and the second about reindeer. So oh. I somehow <laughs> had to combine both. <laughs> but it was also cool to give the presentation at yeah, yeah. my defense because, yeah, you can cover a lot of really cool topics. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a bit challenging, but yeah. very challenging. <laughs> Why did you switch? Was that because of the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns? You had to find different projects to do, or why did you go two different ways? No, this was really I decided to do, the, or I always said I would like if I do a PhD, I would like to do something special, something yeah, yeah. Something not different. just con- because I already did my master thesis in the same lab. So yeah. I wanted to have some kind of uh, special thing as well, something yeah. different. And then, yeah, with collaborations and people talking and connections, it just happened that I was able to to join the people who went from Zurich to Norway. And uh, I could try to do the EEG or we tried all together. And mm. then it worked out and then we just continued. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. What a what a fascinating uh, PhD and fascinating research. Um, Melanie, thank you very much for coming on and talking about this. Um, so be, before you. you go, mm-hmm. it's coming up to Christmas. People will be listening to this. And like I said, some kids may be listening to this or some adults might be listening to this with their kids. Are the reindeer going to be able to stay awake for 24 hours, circumnavigating the globe with Santa Claus, giving out lots of presents? Do you think they're going to be able to do enough sleep optimization before they hit Christmas Eve, before they go? I'm very sure they will be able very to sure. do that. Yes. <laughs> maybe, in 2020, maybe in 2023, we might get some funding to see if we could analyze the sleep of the reindeer and Santa Claus on Christmas Eve. That would be an interesting project. Yeah, that would be so cool. We, we have thought about the same thing. <laughs> when we stopped measuring on the 21st, we thought actually we should have continued this. Until Christmas. <laughs> Maybe next year. So Santa Claus, if you're listening, we'll be putting that ethics in and we'll be looking for funding as well from the North Pole. And um, yeah, listen, Melanie, thank you very much. If people want to follow you, are you on Twitter, ResearchGate, LinkedIn? How can people connect with you? How can people find out about your research? Um, best is probably LinkedIn. Yep. I'm gonna go update it a bit then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think LinkedIn is the best. Yeah. Great stuff, um, Melanie. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time today, and uh, all the best in the future. And well done on finishing your PhD. <laughs> thank you very much, and thanks for having the opportunity to talk about our reindeer research. Anytime. <laughs>